design a board game to in some way or other represent um, some of the things that we'd like to see in the world of the future, perhaps 15 years from now, perhaps five. Now I'm, I'm, I'm setting the scene with John Conway because Conway came up with obviously a combinatorial game theory, but he also came up with a little game called Life. Um, and it was his way of showing that if you come up with a simple set of game rules, you could get unpredictable results. So I'll just let, 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 let him know. this machine, each square had 29 states. In the game of life, you only have two states, on and off, or live and dead, whatever you want to call them. So in the moment, yeah. you have 29 states. If you wanted to do something different, to have some other facility, you just added a few more states. In other words, his machine was designed. Now, my life game wasn't designed. I, I just sort of thought, if you couldn't predict what it did, then probably that's because it was capable of doing anything. For about 18 months of coffee times, and I'm not sure that, you know, we used, I'm sure that we didn't use every coffee time, uh, we tinkered with the rules. The rules as they finally came out were, if you have exactly three live, if you're empty or dead or whatever it is, and you have exactly three live neighbors, then something gets more than that at the next time. Uh, if you are alive and you have two or three live neighbors, then you survive. That's, I mentioned the birth rule first. To be born, you need exactly three live neighbors. To survive, you need either two or three. So there were other iterations of the game that could have been different? Yeah, indeed. You know, well, it was different for quite a long time. We tinkered with these rules and finally came up with the ones I said. And they really seemed to have very nice properties. Maybe you didn't seem to be able to predict what would happen. And in the end, we succeeded in proving essentially anything would happen. These things could do any kind of computation you wanted to do. You could design configurations that rebuilt themselves or built more complicated machines for themselves, all sorts of things. You had no computers when you were doing this scale work? No computers at all. Uh, after a time, there was a computer which had a screen, the PDP-8. So that was all on the goal board. This is um, Conway on the importance of games. And, and this was the thing that, that sparked it off for me. When you know, John, ever since we met, you've shown me tricks and little puzzles. What is the relationship between fun math and serious math? Um, I'm a serious mathematician too. I've got a good job here. Uh, so I do some serious mathematics, but I also do games. And for me, they're very similar. You know, when you play a game, you, if you learn to be good at it, you find what it is you should be thinking about. That's really rather subtle, you know. And that's what we do in mathematics. Puzzles, for instance. What are puzzles? There's something where you could do something that you didn't think you could do. And this last clip, which I think is um, absolutely brilliant, just to show you how, um, you know, you, you can, you know, no matter what stage you are, money is really, really important. True. Um, and these things uh, are called surreal numbers because they have a slightly bizarre aspect. Um, I wrote a little book called On Numbers and Games in which uh, I found all these things. And um, they are like the real numbers in a sense. They are a field. They are, that is to say, you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide in them, except you can't divide by zero. Um, and it's a totally ordered field. There's an order relation. Oh my, look at that money. Um, and, um, and in a sense, this was, it was at least influenced by von Neumann's definition of the ordinals. See, he didn't lose sight of the important thing at that moment. <laughs> so, 
thinking about um, Conway's point, game analogies are quite useful for us. And um, because, as he said, you think about the important things, and at the very least, you aid reflection. So that's why I thought this little exercise. You, you can't design a game, but you can think about the things that you put into it, because it's those elements that you put into it that are important, because they're, you're crystallizing your thoughts and ideas about it. Um, so I'm just going to look at game analogies, a few currencies in games, and then we'll try and do the exercise on thinking. So game analogies first. So we've got game money, Mr. Dodd's social light of money, because games are obviously eminently social, and uh, Ulle Bjerg's um, earlier book was called The Parody of Capitalism, which is a kind of an analogy as well. Um, and there's two ways you go about it. You can look at real world analogies and game currencies, or look at gaming analogies and real world currencies, and what works both ways. Uh, for example, in a Monopoly, this is an interesting point. The starting point in the game is always very interesting, and, and this has changed a lot over the years. Traditionally, if you go back to the 19th century, most board games started with all players equal. And Monopoly is a transitional game, early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century to the 30s. Every player starts with the same amount of money from the bank, and each of the player starts with identical abilities. So in principle, there's no difference. In Dungeons and Dragons, the fifth edition, every player starts with a variable cash budget, and every player or character has variable abilities. In Pandemic, which is a very popular modern game where um, you're dealing with four diseases, uh, every, every character has four action points, but their abilities are different. Um, most cases, they start on the same square. But again, these things have become very asymmetric, which is an interesting point. Now, this is the actual table from D&D. You see that each character that you can, you can play in this game has a, a, a fund partly determined randomly by rolling a, or not rolling, but throwing a D4, four-sided die, and multiplying it by 10, except in the case of the poor old monk who can end up with a minimum of 1 and a maximum of 20 if, if, if uh, the monk is very lucky, 5 D4s. Uh, so that gives you an idea. So there's a game that's trying to, to some extent, emulate some notion of the differences in, um, you know, for characters as they set out uh, in life. So you know, if you were designing a game with that as an important feature, that's something you would put into it. This is a fantasy game, but in a real world game, the same thing would apply. Each of us in life has the same kind of thing starting off. We've got family wealth points, uh, family property, uh, family networking capability, points you get from education, political or social influence of your friends or family, gender points, whether you're male or female, for example, class points, geographic location, do you live up a mountain? Is there an infrastructure where you live? Uh, have you access to technologies? Do you live in Nepal? Um, language points, um, do you have access to mass media communication and of course prejudice, ability to move around, mobility opportunity coming from North Africa, etc. Those kinds of things. So the starting point for each of us is variable. Um, so, you know, for example, you start square, you open your account, you take various actions which are determined by the budget, taking a game analogy. So you go to Eton or the local state school, you go to Oxford or the Polytechnic, or you do an apprenticeship program. Um, you can take various actions in this game to improve your situation, examinations, training courses, work experiences, you earn career points, you get some kinds of rewards from the game as you proceed, which you then rotate around and improve your position. Um, virtual reality world, well, it's kind of augmented. Second Life, as it's called, this is a screenshot from it. It's, it's a sort of half game, half whatever. Um, that uh, game uses Linden dollars. Now, the, the game itself, if you, it's a virtual world, has property rights, but it, do, it doesn't have property rights administered by a central government. So there's a fairly open market on, on the administration and purchase of property. But it's interesting that the currency is owned by the developer, Linden Labs, and they're fairly kind of rigorous about it. For example, when they started charging VAT on Linden uh, dollar transactions in the game, a lot of the European um, residents got very upset um, about it because they were paying VAT that say Americans weren't on these you know, virtual transactions. Uh, you can acquire these Linden dollars through various um, activities. One of them is actually designing um, as they call it, mesh design, buildings, objects, and selling those on the marketplace. 
and they're sold on the marketplace for Linden dollars. So you have to have the Linden dollars and various ways of acquiring them. Uh, you can, of course, buy them on an exchange. You can pay real dollars and real euro for them. Or you can perform services. This is a page from the Second Life Marketplace showing the Linden dollar prices for the, what the customers are buying. So these are popular items at the moment. Um, this is a game that most of us have played, which is called Travelling Around London. Now, it's a real-world activity, but it's also a game, because the map that you use is incredibly game-like. Um, that's the, the actual map that um, goes back to Harry Beck, 1933's design for the London Underground map. Now, if you superimpose on it the, um, the actual layout <laughs> of the London trains, you get that kind of effect there, which is rather bizarre. Um, I'll put it back the way it was, so you see it's, it's, it's completely wrong. Beck's, of course, you know, he was trying to design a system that people could easily find their way from A to B, so he said no, as far as possible, um, degrees beyond 45 or 90, everything. Every, he would have done 90s if he could have got away with it, uh, but there's very few um, uh, uh, angles beyond uh, 90. And being an electrical circuit draftsman, he, t he was kind of taking the idea of the, the coloured wiring um, as a way of colouring. So a lot of things kind of came together. It's a brilliant design. I mean, it's been um, copied around the place. But of course, it's completely inaccurate. Um, and what's interesting is um, Bill Bryson, in one of his books, makes the point um, that if a visitor using this map to get from Bank Station, which is here, to the Mansion House, which is here, would take the train up to here, get onto the circle line, and take another four or five stops or something around to uh, mention. At which point, according to Bryson, and most Londoners would know this, you will find yourself 200 yards down the street from the place that you started at. So it's a useless um, map for navigating above ground. By contrast, a map from a real game, Scotland Yard, is an accurate representation of London. Not only that, you actually have to have, you get a budget of tickets for actual journeys, whether you're using the underground, the bus, or the taxi to travel on. So you're getting your budget at the start of that game, which then allows you to travel uh, around on this map, which is genuine. It's uh, an actual, um, genuine, um, it looks like, like a tourist guide map, but it's pretty good. It's also quite attractive. And I'll show you how accurate it is, because somebody actually superimposed it on top of a satellite image of London. So, for example, um, this is St. Paul's. That's the Smithfield Market up at 53 there. And if I just go back one, if you just keep your eye on St. Paul's down there, you can see St. Paul's Cathedral. And the other buildings, Smithfield Market, Guildhall, all exactly where they ought to be. Um, that map, the Scotland Yard map, you'd look an idiot with it on the tube, but it, do, it does work. Um, now, Monopoly, one of the biggest selling board games of all time, Pandemic, which I'm about to look at, international bestseller at the moment. It's one of the few games that you know, penetrates even into um, you know, Hodges figures, Barnes and Noble, Waterstones, that kind of thing. Now, this is an interesting one because um, the purpose of the game it's a simulation, a representation of fighting four diseases, yellow, uh, red, blue, and black. And they're kind of more or less geographically located. But um, what you have to do in the game is travel to a city, treat a city, research a treatment, share your knowledge with another character in the game, and discover a cure. It's very important to remember it's a cooperative game. You're not competing against other players. You're competing against the game system, the AI of the game which is an important point for us because you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, if we're talking about designing a game for the future, perhaps we should consider a cooperative rather than a, a competitive game. Um, discovery involves exchanging or spending a set of cities, so the set of cities cards becomes a currency in the game. That's how you discover a cure. Um, these are the characters. So these are interesting characters, operations expert, contingency planner, epidemiologist, currently specialist. There's other ones that I haven't included. That's four of them. And they have different uh, actions that they can contribute. And that's the, the difference between them um, in, in the game. They, they have the same kind of four actions, budget, but the other thing is they're allowed special resources. Now, there's another game. This is one called Pollute the Atmosphere. 
um, you can exchange money for tokens that give, uh, give you the right to pollute the Earth's Earth atmosphere. And if one player has more tokens than they need, they can trade those with someone with too few. Uh, the amount of pollution is therefore fixed, oddly enough, at the total number of tokens issued by the national bank, the, 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 the national government, or ca it's capped effectively at that. There's another version of that, which is the ERCS, Emissions Reduction Currency System, it's called. Um, by the way, this is not a, a board game, this is an actual, this is a real world game. Um, the, the land purchased and managed sustainably allows the person who does that to create an independently tradable carbon right. So for good behaviour you get rewarded with a tradable carbon right. Uh, in the other case above you're simply purchasing the right to, to, to pollute. Um, the tip for tap game, this is a, an evolutionary stable strategy game, the idea being that um, this is a competition that Robert Axelrod um, organized back in the 70s or 80s and the idea was he said submit a, a, a strategy, uh, put them into the computer and we'll see which one wins. And the one that won on two occasions was the, the tip for tap game which only has two lines of code. Uh, he thought it would be thousands, but the two lines of code are very simple. One, I open by being altruistic, by being nice, and two, whatever the other player does, I copy it. So if I'm nice and the other player is nice, then I'll be nice. If, um, the, if I'm nice and the other player is nasty or, or, or defects, then I'll defect. Um, and uh, in essence, that strategy came out on top in two of the um, games that um, Axelrod ran. So that's, again, a sort of a, a simulation of, of um, a strategy that human beings seem to actually apply quite naturally. This is an interesting one. It runs on your iPhone, uh, Google. Has anybody heard of this? Augmented reality? Um, I took a screenshot from it the other night, actually. The way this thing works is you're supposed to be fighting a kind of an alien invasion. Google actually started it, I can't remember, it's a good few years ago now. Augmented reality is GPS dependent, meaning it runs on your, on your GPS system, it's not strictly GPS. The immediate rewards of playing this are that you get, um, you have to walk, you have to go to various monuments. So when I was in Dublin the other night, it said go and you can the um, statue of Oscar Wilde in Marine Square, which I actually quite would like to do. <laughs> um, I really dislike it. But uh, there's a few other, and even what basically what it does is it has these monuments and, and uh, landmarks around the city, and you have to go and zap them, and you know, everybody does this. But there's also a social media element to it. It's a game, and um, if you're, you know, you can kind of play along with it. Um, but, you know, there's been quite a bit written about it because it's, some people regard it as a rather sinister um, development because it's also accumulating data about your, your movements and various other things about you. Um, so you're zapping these portals. But it's a game, it's there. Uh, this is the one I referred to earlier, Twilight Struggle. Here's a couple of the cards, uh, early war. These are early war cards. There's also uh, middle war and late war cards. So you've got the Iron Israeli conflict, you've got uh, Asia, the Chinese, so the interesting thing about these games is that they can work for either side. It's an interesting thing. You'd have to play it to, to, to know what I mean. Uh, but what the, the point about the cards is they represent historical events that are deemed important in the actual historical narrative. The designer, um, I think the designer actually, one of the two designers works for Google. Uh, but they, they, they deem these events as, as uh, important and they assemble a card deck which will being shuffled will turn up randomly so they can come up out of sequence and how they play out makes it makes for a particularly interesting game. It's a bit like the game itself uses the map of the world so it's a bit like a much more sophisticated form of risk if anybody's ever played that. This is a voting game. This is quite funny. This is a Charlie Booker. So far the voters have been on Cameron and Miliband but we no longer live in a two-party system or a three-party system or even a system. We may well be heading for a hung parliament. How would that work? Well, here to make some sense of it is Philomena Kunk. Over to you, Philomena. Thank you. I'm in a sort of PlayStation House of Commons, which you can see, and I can't because it's all green where I am. This election is important for politicians because if they lose, they get home. And it's all about winning seats, which is weird because, as you can see, they're actually benches. The important bit's that white dotted finish line down there. Basically, when the votes come in, they sit in rows like a school photo until there's enough of them 
to go over that line. So I can tell what he's doing brilliantly of bringing to make loads of new blue flecker MPs. It might look like this. See, the benches are filling up with blue stuff, like a tenor lady pad. In this case, they've got 335s worth, which means they flood over the line and they won Britain. But what would happen if Labour did sort of okay, but not as good as that? See, that's not enough to get them over the winning line, and apparently they're not allowed to just shuffle along, sort of spacing their bombs apart along the benches so they are off the line. Instead, they have to borrow MPs off other parties. So, say they nicked 25 Liberal Democrats. That's something, but not enough. So, they might have to get some SNP people in, like they've promised they definitely won't. And that does take them over the line, and the SNP and Lib Dem colours are so similar, they'd probably get on. The Tories and UKIP don't want that to happen, but the ones who'd be most angry are the Greens. Because the benches were green to start with before all the other colours came in. So they were winning by 100%, and now they've been left with fuck all. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter what happens in here, it's outside in Great England Kingdom where the politics actually happens. And apparently, if I do this with my arms, I'm outside now. Has it happened? Has it happened yet? <laughs> Has it happened? Has it? Okay. Just not next time. So I'm standing outside on Britain, but it's not real Britain, it's sort of jigsaw Britain. Oh, I can see it on the monitor. It's like being Godzilla or that illegal weatherman. So I don't want to fall over the edge, I'll just take a few steps forward. Anyway, what happens next is some column terror things come up out of the ground. Uh, which is exactly what happened in the 2010 election. These columns aren't really there, although it looks like they are there because I walk behind them. So this is basically like the Matrix. It's mental. And there's also this one, which is more sort of glassy and fragile, and that's numbers everywhere. And as you can see, there's literally no point trying to make any sense of it. It's that complicated. Anyway, that's all with the graphics. So it's back to you, Mr. Brooker. So it's a big game. Um, this is uh, one that um, uh, uh, the lifeboat game, I took it from an idea by um, Buckminster Fuller. The billionaire is taking with him on his voyage all his stocks and bonds, property deeds, diamonds and gold bullion. The ship burns and sinks, there's no lifeboats. If the billionaire holds up to his gold, he's going to sink a little faster than the, than the others. Um, what he now has in Buckminster is a worthless pile of chips of an arbitrary game does not correspond to the accounting processes of our real universe's evolutionary transactions. The catastrophe billionaire's kind of wealth has no control over either yesterday, now, or tomorrow. Um, so it's an interesting, I suppose, if you put somebody with um, those kind of, as I said, set of chips in a catastrophe situation, they have to make a decision about what they're going to take with them. And in that kind of situation, they're pretty much useless. Uh, he did suggest, of course, that they could pay somebody, um, you know, perhaps for a place and, you know, hanging on to a life belt or something like that, or you know, some way of saving. Currencies in the game, this is fairly brief. Uh, ISO 9000 certificates are a certificate that you can, of quality that you can exchange for improved sales. That seems to be the main value of those. University degrees, you certificate of expertise, increase your prospects and salary, and a patent which is a monopoly token and has no real value beyond that. Um, this is another thing, very well known game, Settlers of Catan. Uh, I'm just putting up here the, the, the um, exchange rate for one of these cards. These are resources, resource cards, baseball games, and we've gone to the exchange of these resource cards. You collect sets of them. So a road, you'll need a wood and a brick. Uh, settlement, you need a wood, a brick, a sheep, and a wheat. Uh, a city, you need an existing settlement plus three ore and um, two wheat. This is ore here. Um, and two wheat, and the development card one sheep, one wheat, and one ore. So there's various, as you can see, a, a table of, of uh, resources. The game's more compli complicated than that, but that's the. This is quite interesting. This is the yen economy. This is from um, BBC documentary uh, program from 
the last couple of weeks. This is just a very short clip. This is very interesting. Everybody in McGee's family is a farmer. Yams are the stable crop of these islands, and today is planting day. Just leaving my baby behind. It's just through there around the corner. The first thing that's coming to me here is this place is seriously, seriously cultivated. There's uh, sweet potatoes, bananas, taro, there's everything you need. Then, right in front of me here, you've got the start of all of the yam gardens. Yams are much more than food for the Gears family. They are integral to all cooler expeditions. We have a saying, if you're a man, you must have a young man. If you can't have a young man, you don't have a young man, you're not considered to be a man. Why? Because yams form the basis of wealth for men, because everybody uses yams for all the festivities, and in basically any big ceremonies. Yams are treated much like money with people such as Nagia stockpiling them in yam houses like a bank. These houses also show off the owner's wealth. Uh, the Kula Ring, as it's called, the Kula Expedition is very interesting. Um, the, the, there's a range of, of islands in the Milne Bay. Um, so it's a gift based economy, actually. And they, they're not part of because the actual value of these um, arm bands is minimal, a little bit of um, embroidery work in them. But what they're exchanging them for, in a sense, is the right to actually do other kind of trades because. If, you, if, if somebody gives you one of these armbands, then you are taking on the responsibility of looking after them and their family <coughs> if they should happen to visit the other island, which is where the yams come in because they have to be fed. And traditionally, that was probably what they were going to be fed with anyway, for the most part. <coughs> so it's little to do with the material value of the artifact, it's to do with creating the obligation, the, um, the exchange of the armbands. And this is the cooler ring, which Malinowski wrote about back in 1922 in his uh, Argonauts of the Southern Oceans, I think is the name of the book. Uh, here's a board game version, one of the smallest little board game boxes you can get. Um, Friedman Friese is a very good German board game designer. And this, this is actually a one-person game, solo game. You play it on your own. There's no other competitor. But you're playing entirely against the system. And this is the currency that you use, which is very similar, in an odd win away to the yams. You have to use these things to buy abilities in the game and exchange the abilities in later parts of the game to buy the, to get the food. Um, because when the food runs out, you're, you're dead. If at any point in the game you, you have, you're asked to pay with these little green ears of whatever it is and you don't have one, game's over. Um, Currency in our, our particular game, the game of academia, uh, it's usually quantitative, publication count, citation count. So there's also the area of, dis area of study, natural sciences, um, generally papers can generally count for more. That's the rate of exchange. Um, so Fuller said, it is utterly clear the highest priority need of world society at the present moment is a realistic economic accounting system, which will rectify, for instance, such nonsense as the fact that the top tool maker in India 
highest paid of all craftsmen there gets only as much per month for his work in India to earn per day for the same work if he were employed in Detroit, Michigan. Um, these are some common game mechanics. I've, I've posted this to the group, but um, we can't go through it now, but you know, it's quite interesting. Um, the, it's, it's what's particularly interesting if you look at board games that were done in the middle or up to the um, middle of the 20th century. And even, you know, you go into the average house now, you'll see these kind of rather um, old fashioned games like Risk and Monopoly and, um, you know, a few things. The, none of those things, games, will appear on the, the list on the internet. This is a fascinating one, 1830, where there's a Robert Barron, which deals exclusively in stocks and shares. These are quite complex, um, complex games, actually, a lot of them. Um, and they all have um, combinations of these, and that's not all of the mechanics, that's my sub-selection, um, looking at some of the ones that are currency-based. So if we were designing a game about the future, just wrapping it up, um, you can have a game that's perhaps solitaire, or you can have multiplayer competitive, or you can have multiplayer cooperative. Um, cooperative games, what does that mean, as Wittgenstein said, is there always winning and losing? Think of patience. Yes, because patience is a game I play against um, you know, the system, the game, the card rules. Um, board games traditionally have been zero-sum games, like chess and backgammon and even Monopoly. If there's a winner, there's losers, and the winner gains everything, the losers lose everything. Uh, there are some serious problems in the world that are not solved by the zero-sum approach, obviously global warming, terrorism, mass destruction, migration, quite a few others probably. Um, they're only going to be, and in the currency, only going to be solved by some kind of central, um, action, centrally taken action. Uh, increasingly in those modern board games, like the ones I've been talking about, the players act together against the game system. Pandemic is an excellent example because it's extremely popular. It's almost got to the same, if not beyond the point of, or the point of popularity of Monopoly, for example. Um, and it's also a category of games, which I find particularly interesting, that has grown very rapidly uh, of all categories. So you avoid losing to the game. Now, you tend to think of zero-sum games as human against human, but the cooperative games, it's, it's instructive to think of, are also zero-sum, mm -hmm. except that it's the system that's going to win and the human race loses the game in the long run. Um, now, Monopoly, people may or may not be aware of this, was designed by Elizabeth McGee uh, because she wanted, in some way or other, to embody the economic ideas of Henry George, who was a 19th century economist, and he had a, a problem with the rent economy. Now, I don't think it's a great game, her particular version. She got a patent for it, I think, in 1904. But it's not a great game. It's, it's, it has problems. And when it was improved on by Charles Darrow, oddly enough, Parker Brothers sold the Landlord's game and Darrow's version of it, Monopoly, side by side in the 1930s. They had both in their catalogue. But his took over. And his took over because, it, first of all, it improves on hers a little bit. But also, it has that competitive element. It's you know post uh, the Great Depression, 1930s. People were probably ready for this kind of um, sort of violent uh, conflict about property. The question you have to ask yourself, though, about Charles Darrow, you kind of people always think, you know, is it kind of representing you know the players as these you know aggressive um, you know property tycoons, you know, doing everybody down? But uh, what always struck me about the game is. You know, what, when does the game actually end? It ends when you know, somebody has all the property, but is that the end of the game? It's like the scene in the movie when the couple rides off into the sunset, and that's the end of the movie, but it's not the end of their lives. You know, they get down the road and they have their first argument. Um, so all that uh, you can learn, in a sense, you can learn a couple of things from Monopoly, but one of the things you can learn, obviously, is that you can acquire a lot of property in this way, and you can have a, a rent kind of economy. But what happens to the players who lose everything? You know, somebody wins, what happens to all of the players who lose in the real world, as, as the, you know, the point beyond the end of the game? Um, so, there's various possibilities. I've been struggling with it, I have to say, um, and today's session didn't help much, because all it did was fill, I, had, I already had a pot full of ideas, and now it's actually full of even more ideas and they're all mixed up. 
I was thinking of, um, of Buckminster Fuller's Manual for Spatial Birth, and I thought maybe that's a game that, and I thought of, of Nigel's Utopia, maybe I want to design that game, you know, do, do, do Thomas More's thing, but as a board game. Um, and the thing is, if you set out to do a game like that, the key thing you'd have to ask yourself, going back to John Conway, is what are the things that you think are important to put into it? Would I, um, when I would I have to have people in there, presumably? Well, what resources would I think are important? What, you know, maybe political ideas would I have to put in or think I would have to put in? Um, that's really it. I mean, that's where I had got to. I don't know whether that, that kind of gets us anywhere, but that's where I had got to. It's a bit of a, it's a, except a bit of a kind of a, a, a mixture of ideas. But I think, I mean, it's in, in line with the, the rest of the day was a bit like that. I mean, there's just so much going on. It's complicated, as Donica said, it's a complicated area, money. It's a complicated subject. And there's, all, there's a political dimension, there's, a, you know, there's the economic dimension, there's government, there's, there's you know, human emotion, there's theatre, everything's going on in there, you know. And, and we don't seem to be, you know, we don't seem to, the, every time you think about it, it takes you off in a different direction, um, you know, in each way. What do you think? Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you writing this up? I'm, I, I'm trying. It's I'm amazing. trying. The encyclopedia of Brilliant. Can I say a couple of things? Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. Second Life. Because uh, I had a student who researched Second Life and uh, World of Warcraft. For as an ethnographer, so she did a virtual ethnographer. Oh, yeah. And looking at the economy, uh, and, and it, Second Life was interesting because it came out as incredibly feudal. You know, it's, it's, the, the land thing is interesting because there's the land barons who are private there in the private yeah. regions, and then there's Lincoln Labs that own their own mainland. But I wanted to say, if, if you go into Second Life, there's a game within Second Life, there's an area called Wasteland, which is based on an old game, I've forgotten the name, but identical looking. Um, it's an old Armageddon sort of post-apocalyptic area and the wastelands consist of about seven or eight sins and they have a game within the wastelands which is much more interesting in terms of currency. So, so it's second lifers live or in the wasteland, they have property there and they play this game as a sort of uh, mutant post-apocalyptic yeah. characters and they, and they trade. Um, so it's worth researching that. Um, it's much more interesting than the main second line, yeah. game, which is actually just sort of consumer. It's totally consumer. And yeah. porn and land, basically. Yeah. Monopoly, just a story. I, when I first played Monopoly with someone really good, it was a brother with a girlfriend I had years ago. And we got to the point where he owned everything. So I, I was ready to say, okay, that's finished now. Then he started doing deals. So like, I was landing on his property. And uh, I was just naive, I was like a 16 year old kid reading Marx, right? So I was thought he was a complete ass. So he started saying, look, uh, you know, you don't have to pay all of the, the rent. You can just pay a bit and then but you give me the percentage of the rent um, that you get. And I also want to land on your property. I don't have to pay, right? So we played for like this for about an hour. I just got more and more stuffed into the ground. And in the end, I, I remember just, just getting up in this rage, going, this is just crap. This is not, you're not playing by the rules. Because it doesn't say anything in there. And, and he sort of like, was a lot older than me, he just said, look, it's reality. You know, like, that's capitalism. And it was brilliant, because so he said, as the game ended, it ended when I could no longer take it. Yeah. Because there was no way I was going to get out of it. I was completely out without killing it, which is what I sort of wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. so, so Monopoly is a really good example. That's why we have revolutions. Yeah, exactly. That was the only thing I could have done. Is you well, you see, the difficulty that I have with this is that Elizabeth McGee's softer version doesn't work as a game. Right. You know, and it doesn't really teach you enough of a lesson either. But Monopoly, the, the, the way I'm playing Monopoly this would teach you the lesson. He was amazing. You see, the game itself doesn't have to be kind. You know, you don't have to think, you know, there's a big rosy ending to the game. No. You know, savage. It's savage. It is a savage game, yeah. But that, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to then take the game and extrapolate it into the real world and say, well, you know, 
that's how that's how it's supposed to work. I kind of did though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty common. I mean, I know a lot of people who play Monopoly and end up annoyed at the person that, you know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, like you've got five family members playing it, yeah. and four of them are really pissed off at the one that won. Because in order to win it, you have to be a bit of a bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's not just luck at the draw. Right? Yeah. You have to grind people down. I, I do. don't know if you've thought about this, Kevin, but have you? How much have you done at looking at the, the um, kind of higher transactional video games? I'm thinking about things like, like the Candy Crush game that a lot of people play, for example. There's quite simple ways to gamify something and draw them in by real or perceived rewards in a high transaction environment, right? Because it's a very high transaction game, but they create a rarity to it because you only get, I think you only get 15 minutes a day or something. That's right. And then, and then you have to pay in order to cut you off. So, so I know people who like live for their 15 minutes. It's quite interesting. Um, another one I don't know if you've seen is an old game now called uh, Rise of Nations. Uh, it's an old uh, PC simulation game. You'll still get it. It'll still run, I think, on a PC if you get it. Uh, but you have to go online and find someone who has a copy. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of economics, uh, research, and warfare. And when it becomes very interesting is you can play it uh, on a closed network or online and you can play in cooperation with others or so you, can, you can do treaties or whatever or just all, all, all competitive work. It's very interesting because if you have four or five people playing it, so if you went out and spent 50 euro and got five copies of this, put it up on the local network and get people to play it. You have them all in a separate room so they can't talk to each other comfortably easily and then see what happens in terms of who gangs up on who. Very mm -hmm. interesting. And really detailed rise of nations. It's I, I, you know, I'm, you're right. I, I've kind of steered clear of the video games for the moment because there's a whole other. I mean, you've just mentioned one, a whole other set of kind of interactive dimensions that open up. But I think the reason rise of nations might be interesting if you look at. It, I think it has a lot of the qualities you're talking about, but it's a much faster transaction rate. Yeah. yeah. So you can speed up uh, some stuff. And then the last one is to look at in-game economies in. Uh, in stuff like the consoles, because they're not as sophisticated as Second Life. But we were talking just beforehand about FIFA, you know, this yeah. game FIFA. Um, there's a whole economy has been created gradually over the different iterations of the game. And in this current iteration, I was saying to Kevin, they had a, a problem where there was essentially counterfeiting. Because somebody had figured out how to have bots play the game to earn money. And then what would happen is, let's, so that was saying to Kevin, let's say Messi is worth Two million, but the reason he's worth two million because you'd have to play for years to get two million coins. But the reason is people would set up bots to play the game, and they would earn two million, and then you go and give them twenty euro of real money, and then they will buy a crappy player off you who's worth five hundred for two million, and then you two million to buy Messi. Yeah. So it was essentially counterfeiting. But what the, what EA what EA Games did was they came in and they put price controls in place, and they buggered up the system. By, by putting price controls in. So I think, I think there's multiple interesting examples in, in, the, in the video game space. And I just think there'll be a higher transaction, and there should be data there. I and mean, you could get in touch with EA and ask them a question. I, yeah. I actually know some people in the area. I, I think the role of the game controller is really, really interesting here, like in Second Life and Lincoln Maps, is often yeah. referred to by players as the equivalent of God. This kind of God who can make arbitrary <coughs> decisions. Um, and here, EA is like playing, you know, so you, what, what's that central authority doing and setting rules? But the other thing, Linda Maps is interesting because a lot of the time they just let things go. So if, if, if you get defrauded within Second Life, if you buy something or somebody and they, they, they deliver it, Linda Maps won't touch it. They're, they're not yeah. interested. They, they see it as gameplay. They say yeah. it's just gameplay, you just yeah. put it But if somehow something affects their struct, their game architecture, then they jump on you and they will ban you. There was a story in Japan about eight years ago about a guy who was playing World of Warcraft and had some incredible sword and never played the game. And somebody right. gave him 2,000 real dollars to yeah. sell him the game, or sell him the sword in the game, yeah. and they took the money and didn't give him the sword, so the other guy came and killed him. Yeah, that's what I remember. In Japan. And World of Warcraft is really Well, you know, that is Japan. <laughs> World of Warcraft is interesting too because but it's the emphasis on labour. Yeah. People get very upset about games. Yeah, they do. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. I mean, there's this. Uh, have you come across this book? No. Jesse Shell, The Art of Game Design. Donna and I were using it on a, on a paper two years ago. And this is the current edition. By the way, you note it's called The Art yeah. of Game Design. Yeah. Um, but he, he t he's a whole section in there about politics and a thing, something they call griefing. 
Yes, Brief, a briefing is what people do when they basically just sort of nuke the game situation. Yeah, it's a bit like trolling. Trolling, effectively, yeah, but it, it, in, in effect, yeah. And there's also the, the, the king-making syndrome. I'm about to lose the game and I don't want him to win, so I let her win by passing her in effect whatever is possible. Yeah. Or the other one where you know people go after the, the person in the lead. There's that game with the resources, the sheep, the wool, the ore, and Catan. There's a well-known problem in that there's the trading part of the game and where you're supposed to sort of do deals. You can say, I'll give, I need sheep or I need wool. Has anybody got wool and I'll give them ore? And it only ever seems to work between two players who have the commodities that are opposite and also are not winning, are not in the lead, are perceived by both of them not to be in the lead. And only in those situations will they actually be prepared to trade. trade. If there's any sense of one person is ahead of the other, they won't do the trade. The, the last one I'll suggest to you is the refugee game. I don't know if you've come across this, but I did some work with a charity in Hong Kong and um, at uh, Davos every year, they run this thing. So they take essentially like a warehouse and they'll bring in the billionaires and they'll put them through a refugee experience. So you walk in and you get pushed around by people with mock AK-47s, but it's very real and very aggressive. Yeah. And within minutes, you've got no jewelry, no shoes. And, and then they put you at a table with some basic materials for making what they, it's a, like making wicker baskets or something Fantastic. like that. But you have, to, you have to get raw materials to be able to make the wicker baskets and to be able to sell. Yeah. The whole object of the game is your group to put one person in school. So it's a very real reflection of the property trap. But the way they play the game, you know, even if you walk up, like I, I played it once um, with a group, and one of my colleagues who was there with me walked up to do a trade with the central, the guy who controls the, the raw materials. And uh, he couldn't, he didn't have enough to, uh, uh, to buy their own materials. And the guy behind the desk said, I'll give them to you if I can give her a hug. Which was obviously, uh, uh, but it's extremely powerful. But have a, have a look at it, and, and I think you might be interested in this. I think if you look at the impact and some of the feedback from people who are billionaires, fascinating. So that's another one I'd recommend. That's Davos, yeah, yeah. You didn't mention Minecraft, did you? Which Minecraft? Minecraft. Minecraft. Did you mention Minecraft? Um, I didn't mention Minecraft, no. You must I have like I assume you have. Is there currency in Minecraft? I haven't checked yeah, that there out. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah probably is now. Yeah. And again, it's fascinating because yeah. it's almost like utopic in the sense that it starts with a, you start with nothing. And if you play the survival version, oh, yeah. everything is, is wrapped up. So you. Yeah, you have to hide at night, you have, to, you have to get resources, you have to mine, you have to, and if you work with others, you know, you can it's, start, it's, I play with my son, quite a lot of time yeah. mining, yeah. it's really fascinating. It's so unpleasant, I do. We came across, I came across, what was that game in Poland, where, where the, 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 oh, yeah, um, I get the name of it now. Yeah, what was the, and there was one called Third World Farmer, somebody had written yeah. a game called Third World Farmer, oh, where of. you were supposed to die. That was the that was the point of the game. You, yeah, you couldn't survive. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Anyway. So um, I don't think we're going to get any further. That was brilliant. Thanks. Twenty-five. So will we give up on the game design? Because I'm, I'm just very briefly on the game design. I was thinking as you were talking about game design. Okay. One option would be to uh, the, the blockchain or Bitcoin could be the very central theme on on the game. So All right, good point. Because at the moment, blockchain and Bitcoin are our, our games in some sense, and the question is, is it going to, is it going to end? Yeah. You know, what's, how is it going to end? That's the big problem. And it is in some sense a, a group of people against the system. So you have the blockchain in, in, in that sense is very similar to these cooperative games, where the system might just beat all the. All the what's the threat of them? The great thing about any game, if it is it a cooperative game or is it a competitive game? I'd say it's a cooperative game. It's a co-op game. Because so, you've all the miners yeah. are cooperating. Right? So we, we, we enter the game world, what's the immediate threat that we're facing? Well, that the system will, it's, the system itself will kill the system. Could, could close it down. The could system, it down. The, yeah. The blockchain itself could be monopolized. You could get 51%. Um, you could have uh, exit. The, the, you know the big, the, the whole thing about the blockchain is it has to, people have to keep generating it. So yeah. people pull out. And you, 
when does it get to the point where it's just no longer? Could it, could it, could it, could it actually go out? Yeah. You could also have a bubble and a crash. Yeah. Could it go out of fashion? Yeah, you, yeah, you could in, you could introduce a thing where it starts out with everybody in the blockchain, or people decide to get in or out. But there could be a point in the game where an individual could win by switching sides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a common thing now in a number of uh, co-op games that there's a spy, sorry, a traitor. So everybody theoretically is is supposed to be cooperating. There's one called it, Shadows Over Camelot. Everybody is supposed to be achieving the goal, but somebody has been secretly right. drawn this mission where they're right. to, to, in effect, counter, run counter. And it isn't apparent until towards the very end of the game. Right. You know, so perhaps something, you could introduce something like that. And also maybe you could play around with the idea of the side chain. How would that work? Which, yeah. which is almost like a route off the blockchain. So in, in Bitcoin, the main blockchain can't, can't be changed, but you have side chains where you can have new rules, new ways of, uh, and they kind yeah. of go off the main, the main system. Um, and for, for a lot of people, this was Bitcoin 2.0, whereas of course Ethereum claimed it was. But so side chains are really worth looking at. I can send you some things on that, um, and that's where you can be quite. I, I, I could have, you could imagine, you know, could you imagine a side chain becoming so successful that it actually starts to encroach yeah. on the principles governing the main blockchain? And of course, it's the politics around. I mean, some of the most interesting stuff in Bitcoin is the t tension between the, the, the tech people, the developers, the guys. You know, they're only about still only about forty people worldwide when the other stuff works. How, how, how would you blockchain. represent? And the, well, you've got the big powers. You've got the Bitcoin Foundation. They're the politicians, and, and then you've got the techies. And there's a kind of split between them now. So you can have these different characters. Running, you know, running it as opposed to running the tech. I don't know, for, later, for, a, for a time, the altcoin, the spate of yeah. altcoins had shot out. Yeah. That, that was a game. Yeah, it was. People were playing to see whose altcoin would, would yeah. outrun. And, and that seems to be over now, because I was reading yeah. something which was saying that you know, a, a year ago, I think Bitcoin had about 60% of the altcoin market. Now it's gone up to like 90. Yeah. So altcoins, so it's really, Winning. Yeah. So rivals would be interesting. And then the whole question of incentive, you know, why Well I was just gonna say what's what's the what's, the, yeah. what's yeah. the success? What, right. what how how will you very complex and very well you could start out with a number of coins and if it's successful they appreciate. Yeah. So that's a numeric um, target. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. On the other hand, you could that's one measure of success. Another measure of success might be adoption. So, like, you know, is, is a measure of Bitcoin success that perhaps $1,200, or would a measure of its success be that 10,000 retailers take it? Yeah. Yeah. You see, in the pandemic game, you lose when the when pandemic spreads. spreads. In the blockchain game, you win yes. when it achieves a certain penetration yeah. across the, the map, yeah. etc. Yeah. And is the map a geographic map, or is it something, some other kind of... Uh, yeah. mm. I think a geographic map is easy for people to yeah, because yeah, there are clear geographical yeah. issues with Bitcoin. If you look at where Bitcoiners are, they're generally in certain, I mean, in certain parts of the world and around certain cities. Yeah, they're not all over the place. I saw a statistic yesterday, 80% of Russians, 8-0, have never heard of it. Yeah, well, that's a, like, a bit like the UK election recently. Yeah. Uh, about 80% of the voters hadn't heard of Twitter. Yeah, they did, they didn't wrong. know yeah. that it was supposed to be a close election. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's the true actually. Yeah. You see, that's the problem for people who live in the Twitterverse. We kind of, we don't, we're only getting one message. And then no, the, it's true. On Bitcoin, it's, last time I was in Dublin, the, the, uh, on the Saturday morning after I opened here, the taxi driver was taking me to the airport. And he said, well, where have you been then? And I said, well, this conference and the site was here. And I thought, oh, just, you know, he said, what was all that about? I thought, oh, God, I can't tell him. So I just said, oh, it's all about Bitcoin. He said, oh, Bitcoin. So I stopped telling him on the journey to Dublin Airport. By the time he dropped me off, he said, I'm going to go and get some. I said, no. Really into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dublin now is into You didn't use the word magic, did you? He's probably lost his car. That's that. I'm going to like property, so it's a 
taxi drivers start playing it, it's not just <laughs> Well, look, I've got the basics of this thing now, and I'd just like to point out that the copyright is mine. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. <laughs>